Hello, everyone. I'm Rose Gerber, COA's Director of Patient Advocacy and Education. Thank you for joining us today. As you know, this is an educational series, and as an oncology organization, we focus on national issues that impact local patient care. A lot of our efforts are focused on issues related to pharmacy benefit managers. Yesterday, the Federal Trade Commission announced that they are launching an inquiry into the business practices of pharmacy benefit managers and how they influence drug prices and the pharmacy business. The FTC will be looking at how PBMs negotiate drug prices on behalf of health plans and decide which medications get preferential treatment and how that impacts pharmacies, payers, which is the insurance, doctors, and most importantly, patients. So visit our website to learn more. And as I like to do every so often, it's always in my mind, but I and take the time now to say it out loud. I also want to thank our CPAN chapter advocacy leaders and all of our advocates across the United States for their ongoing advocacy efforts, especially keeping going through all the challenges the last two years. Our CPAN chapters and advocates are now back to hosting live CPAN educational events, as well as virtual events in their cancer centers. Most recently, they hosted events and are continuing to host events on the value of clinical trials. As you may recall, May was clinical, National Clinical Trials Research Month and our speaker was Dr. Kapoor. And we talked a lot about the value of trials, uh, not only to cancer patient, cancer centers, excuse me, but especially to cancer patients. So all of our CPAN advocacy leaders and advocates, you're a very important part of CPAN and I appreciate all of your efforts. Well, We've now moved on from Clinical Research Month and June is National Cancer Survivors Month. And we have the absolute perfect guest for you. Judy Pearson is a triple negative breast cancer survivor and an award-winning author. And I wanna pause a little bit on that award-winning author. When I say award-winning, I'm talking about major book awards. So you'll have to get a copy of her book. And uh, not only has she won incredible awards, she has an incredible website. You can read so much more about her. She's really an accomplished individual and the fact that she's a cancer survivor makes it even more impressive. So today we're going to learn a little bit about Judy's personal cancer experience and we're also going to be able to gain her insight into the cancer survivorship movement. It is now my pleasure to introduce Judy Pearson. Next slide please. Thank you and what Rose forgot to say is that she's also my friend <laughs> yes. and, yes. and that's super important to me. Well, I thought I'd begin by uh, telling you a little history. Um, the slide uh, shows the various iterations of Judy. So in the middle was about 10 days after my chemotherapy had begun and um, my husband's kids were visiting. We lived in Michigan at the time. I took a shower that morning and a clump of hair came out. And I was like, okay, we're gonna take control of this. We're gonna have a head shaving party on the deck. And that's what we did. Um, my husband's head has always looked like that. He, he <laughs> had to shave his head for the party. But to back up just a little bit, um, we were newlyweds and uh, I had had a clean mammogram in um, about two months before I found a suspicious lump just while scratching. And I asked David to feel it because men will feel your boobs if you ask them to. And <laughs> he said it was indeed something new. And after all of the diagnostics that many of you are familiar with, um, I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, which the oncologist explained to me, because of course, until you join the club, you don't know very much. Um, she explained to me that it was very aggressive and needed aggressive treatment, and I was going to hate her by the end of it, but she was going to save me. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a pretty good, pretty good bargain. Um, I am a researcher by profession because I write biographies. So I very carefully researched my cancer, my mastectomy, my chemo drugs, but it never occurred to me to research survivorship. I, I didn't even think it was a thing. I thought the minute I was unplugged, the old Judy would jump out of the chemo cake and nothing could be further from the truth. I'm very fortunate to not have had a lot of psychosocial issues because I had a very supportive um, husband and grown sons and friends and family members, but I had a lot of physical effects that I wasn't expecting. And when I went back to that same oncologist the next time and said, 
I don't understand these night sweats, the chronic fatigue and insomnia. Why didn't I know about this, the joint pain? And she snipped at me, well, I was busy saving your life and it didn't seem important to talk to you about survivorship at the time. So that kind of took me by surprise. And I thought, huh, I guess I have to have to start researching survivorship, which I did. I discovered that we're, at least at that time, I'm, I'm hoping that things have changed some in the now 11 years since my diagnosis and, and treatment. We're rarely prepared for that. It, it's, you are focused on that instant in the timeline of your life to get rid of this cancer. And you just figure at the end of it all, I'm, I'm going to be me again. So I wasn't unique. At the same time, I started looking back at some research I'd been doing before my diagnosis about uh, courage. I was going to write a book about women's courage because I had written already about some courageous people and thought, well, that would be a nice um, next step. The book never happened. But in preparing for that, I had two amazing discoveries. One was an interview with my neighbor's best friend from high school, who was um, an ovarian cancer survivor. And when I spoke with her, and she told me about all the things she was doing at her local hospital, she lived in New Orleans, then um, she'd started a support group for stage four ovarian cancer survivors, she was writing a newsletter. And I thought to myself, this is the pre cancer Judy, I thought to myself, why is she doing that? She should be going on cruises. Well, the post-cancer Judy understood that there's great healing and helping. At the same time, as I reviewed this interview with uh, Chris, was her name, I came across some statistics I had found for one of my chapters about the measurable and tremendous health benefits of volunteering. And I put together volunteering and um and survivorship and thought, wow, this is really a thing. And it's funny in life, you don't even have to be a cancer survivor to do this. In life, when you get to a point and you think, wow, how did I get here? And you look back over your shoulders at the pretend footsteps in the sand, you see that every step you took, everything that happens kind of leads you to the next thing. And I realized that everything I had been through led me to the moment where I discovered helping was healing. And I created this little organization as a result of that. Um, so because Rose has so much spare time, I had <laughs> asked her <laughs> to, um, and because she knows me pretty well, asked her to maybe put together some questions th she thought would be interesting um, to kind of make this all come together. So Rose, it's, it's on to you. Okay. Um, before we do that, Judy, I want to just take a few minutes because when you, when you and I were talking and you sent over some photos to me, um, I really was just fixated by your, by your photos of your head shaving because for cancer survivors, many of us have had this experience. Um, my experience was also on the deck. And interestingly, it looks like you have the yellow house and kind of like that looks very similar to, to our backyard. And you're smiling, you know, and like, you know, I was just bawling and shedding tears. And, but what's captivating about it is that it demonstrates that everybody processes cancer differently and no ways right or wrong. But when I looked at this, I'm like, wow, I want to be more like Judy. But I remember that moment being very different. And as you have gone through your own survivorship experience and talked to so many survivors, is that something that you've also found that everybody processes differently? Like I look at you there and I'm like, wow, you're literally that warrior woman. You are that woman who's like, I'm going to conquer this, you know? And then there's people who, you know, I was very private during my time. And, you know, and then you're this now this woman on the right, you know, who's a well-known public speaker. You have authored many books, not just about cancer, many other topics. You know, was that just who you always were? Um, I think so. I think um, in our family, um, and I've, I've since come to realize this after both my parents ha have now died, 
my father was a larger than life guy. I mean, he was literally John Wayne, George Patton and Archie Bunker all rolled into one and um, a very successful businessman. And he, he was the kind of guy, both my brother, I have a younger brother and I just really wanted to be. Mm. My mother was quiet and consistent and loving but she too had a very strong personality. And I feel very blessed to be a combination of that. Mm -hmm. It also, part of it, I think, um, my heritage is British. My father's family um, was British. And the Brits don't cry, as you probably know, uh, Downton Abbey notwithstanding. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Queen doesn't cry. And, <laughs> right, me too. And we don't cry. So it was just sort of, it was exactly a warrior thing. The other interesting part of this is um, about two weeks after the head shaving, my son deployed for six months to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So as he was fighting his enemy, our enemy. Um, I was I was fighting mine, and I saved all the email exchanges we had because they were pretty poignant. In fact, I put together a little anthology of the articles and blogs I had written uh, during cancer, and one of the chapters is Warrior to Warrior, and it's all wow. about exchanges. And I told you she was an interesting woman. Okay, so as far as my next question, we're going to start by going to the next slide. Uh, please, we can advance the slide. So Judy, you've given us a little bit of a window into your background. You said you're a researcher by trade. So when you have this, you know, semi awkward encounter with your physician, um, you then you go into researcher mode. But tell me a little bit more, tell our audience a little bit more about, you know, what inspired you to narrow in on this book? Because um, I do know that now I know this because I worked in advocacy and I'm an 18 year survivor. So I know a lot. But at the time when I was a new patient, I didn't know anything about the background. So why this book? And why the title to explain the title? I will. I will. So because I started a second act and our um, our mission is to support and celebrate women survivors of all cancers who are giving back to the greater good in their survivorship doesn't mean you have to found an organization. It can just be random acts of kindness, because whenever you shine your energy um, out to the world or out to some particular cause, you're taking the focus off yourself and, and thereby healing. So um, in 2016, I launched this organization and I was introduced um, to Susie Lay, a woman who lives in Tucson. I live in Phoenix, a woman who lives in Tucson. And she was one of the founders of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. I had never heard of it before, the organization. And that random introduction kind of opened the door to the material that became this book, um, which I am um, so proud to say just won the gold, uh, a gold Nautilus Award for 2022. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the title comes from the fact that Prior to the survivorship movement be beginning in 1986, survivors had to live in the shadows. There was still a lingering, this is unbelievable, there was still a lingering fear of contagion. Um, they could lose their jobs because employers figured they were going to be a sickly lot and not show up. Now, this is even people who had finished their treatment. Right. Um, you could, I'm old enough to remember, you could actually be asked on a job application if you'd ever had cancer. Yeah. And um, if you had insurance, uh, health insurance was just becoming a thing in, in the 80s, um, employer offered health insurance, you could have your, your insurance canceled. And so it wasn't until this group of intrepid individuals uh, came together and said, this stops now and started lobbying against all this discrimination we as survivors lived in the shadows. And this is a group biography as opposed to focusing on just one person. It, it uh, alternately focuses on the stories of five, including Susie, of the um, founders who launched and led the movement. And you know, Judy, if I can also add to, to dial back something, you know, and full disclosure, I'm still working my way through this book because this is not a book that you can just kind of flip through. It's not you know, a met like a, just a memoir where you could just read and it's interesting. You got to really put your thinking cap on. There's a lot of statistics. There's a lot of it's like it's, it's extremely well done. Um, 
but what's I think something that's really remarkable for the listeners to know about is this was the first group. Now, anybody who just ASCO just finished, ASCO in Chicago, the big international oncology conference, and every year in the ASCO pavilion, there's a, at ASCO at McCormick, the big uh, convention center, of course, Judy knows she used to live in Chicago and in fact is recognized as one of Chicago's most inspirational women, women but now she's in Arizona. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, back to McCormick, anybody who's been to this conference is huge. It's a huge conference, international conference. And there's a, a full dedicated advocacy pavilion in this massive convention center, and there's hundreds of advocacy booths. So it's hard for people to recognize that at one time there was nothing. Tell us about that, Judy, please. Well, and that's not, um, I mean, again, it, when you think that this was so incredibly recent, um, there were some small groups, um, local groups who were advocacy and survivorship support organizations. The American Cancer Society existed, but again, everyone's focus was on, um, we'd kind of given up on the overall blanket of curing cancer. Um, that word was, was still used for quite a while, but as, as you'll read in, in this book, newspaper uh, articles and journalists and people still called us cancer victims. I mean, we were just it was just such a misunderstood thing. And um, it was called the big C because, um, and, and that was because there was very little prior to the 70s that could be done for someone diagnosed with cancer. So if you couldn't, as a physician, if you couldn't cure someone, um, there wasn't a lot of good news. So why even mention it? And they didn't. But then in 1971, Richard Nixon declared war on cancer by signing the National Cancer Act. And it infused $1.3 billion into, um, into uh, research. At that time, only about 50% prior to the 1970s, only about 50% of those diagnosed with any cancer survived. So this money and, and 1.3 billion in the 70s is over $8 billion today. It was unheard of. And he promised against the advice of his scientific team that we would cure the disease by the bicentennial in 1976. And of course, unfortunately in 1970, uh, by 1976, all anyone remembered about Richard Nixon was his departure from the White House. But the fact of the matter was that money created the foundation for darn near every drug that was used going forward, some still used. Um, the drugs that were discovered during that time saved my life. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just, and it's, it's an astounding fact that we don't remember very well because Nixon's, uh, presidency was so overshadowed by point. Vietnam at the beginning and his departure. Judy, I'm going to jump in real quick here. Um, can we, since you're talking about this historic moment, can we please advance to the slide um, what, that features this, yeah, this historic moment? Yep. Uh, so what, so that set the stage. What did your research uncover that you feel was missing or didn't happen or still needs to happen? Well, so again, the focus was on, was, was all about cure, treatment, without the, without any forethought as my okay. oncologist, okay. of what comes next. And so okay. one of the, um, one of the co-founders of um, the NCCS, National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, I think put it very succinctly. He said, and I'm going to read it so I get it right. Um, this was from Dr. Fitzhugh Mullen, who I had the great advantage of, of interviewing and meeting several times. It is as if we have invented sophisticated techniques to save people from drowning, but once they've been pulled from the water, we leave them on the dock to cough and splutter on their own in the belief that we have done all we can. And that's a pretty good definition, I think, of, of survivorship. We think, you know, they were trying very hard to save people. Right. And then, okay, next. And I, I think that's, that's really um, poignant. And I think it ties back to your opening comment, Judy, about what your oncologist said, you know, and maybe the oncologist too, they were just so fixated on, we're just going to cure you. But then what happens? And I know 
um, there was what I call the fictional five-year mark, where after you're done with five years of your, quote, primary treatment, you're supposed to be good. Um, anyone who's a long-term survivor, and I'm very grateful to be in that group now, we still have issues. And that's what you're addressing, um, which is very powerful for all of us. Next slide, please. I'm going to take a look at, we have a couple of comments. Um, okay. Oh, the National Coalition of Cancer Survivorship. Judy, yep. go ahead. Tell us about the, the role of this organization. As you mentioned earlier, there were organizations like the American Cancer Society has been around for a long time, but this was survivorship focused. That's okay. how, and how they all came together. So they all came together. There were um, 26 of them. Um, they were an extraordinary group of people. Um, many of them were survivors in their own right. Some were doctors and nurses. Some uh, worked in local organizations. Um, the founder of what is now Cancer Support Community, he founded the Wellness Community, um, was among them. And they came together over a weekend that was ultimately called the Continental Congress of Survivorship. Um, and just like those men had been um, back in the 1770s, this group brought together their vast expertise and they shined a light on the fact on this growing number of survivors. And one of the most important things they did, um, particularly in light of the, what was it called? The Fab Five? No, the, yeah. the what did you call it? About five years, the five year survivorship? Oh yeah, the statistic around it, it was always traditionally that after you've done five years of your primary treatment, you're done, Rose, you're great, you're good, you're, you know. So they said, this is ridiculous that, you know, it's this moving goal line. After three years, you can be good. After right. 10 years, you can be good. After five years, you can be called a survivor. So does that mean that the day after you hit five years, if you're diagnosed with another cancer, another primary cancer or a metastasis from your original, are you not then a survivor? And they right. said, no, this is wrong. A person becomes a survivor at the moment of diagnosis because that's when they start surviving cancer. And right. for some people that's hard to wrap your mind around, yeah. but it takes the pressure off. And in fact, it's funny, I was at ASCO <laughs> at my three-year mark. And I was speaking with, I don't remember, I think it was an oncologist, um, and she asked me, it was a woman, I do remember that, about um, was I a survivor? And I said, yes. And she said, um, or I said, well, not yet. I haven't reached my five-year mark yet. This is before right. I do all this. And she said, but you said you had triple negative. And I said, I did. And she said, well, for you, survivorship begins at three years. And I was like, oh, yay, I'm there. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. But, but the idea that they define survivorship, I think, is incredibly important. Yeah. Remember also that in 1986, this was just on the heels of the AIDS movement. Mm -hmm. And they took quite a few organizational pages from that movement in terms of, you know, bringing awareness to survivorship itself. Although it, it took them, um, took them a long time. And in some circles, it's, you know, it's still hard to get their, their information um, through, but they were, they were pretty amazing people. Um, speaking of the AIDS movement, in my very early day, right now I'm focused on larger uh, national oncology issues, not larger than, I mean, just I focus more on the national oncology landscape, but early, in my early years with breast cancer advocacy, and I remember learning about the important role of the AIDS activists, and a lot of their tactics at the time were very controversial because they were really loud and in your face, and, but, you know, they, they really shook things up, and whether people agreed with them or not, they did, you know, we do have to give credit, and you say that in your book, um, you know, you have to give credit to these people who, you know, who did, you know, speak up and, you know, set the, set the foundation for the rest of us. Um, we're going to want to go on to another slide now as well. And it's, it's kind of a squeaky wheel thing. Yes. So, so the survivorship journey, um, I, I think this is hilarious. Um, I use this a lot in my presentations, obviously. So we think, the world thinks, that survivorship is like at the bottom of the arrow, that's where you start, and boom, you make it to the top and you're there. Right. And, um, and in fact, just as an aside, my own brother, now there's just the two of us, um, our cousin, with whom we were very close, died uh, in 2020 of metastasized melanoma. And after all the talk I've done over the last then nine years, I guess, 10 years about survivorship and cancer, 
my brother said, well, that's it for me then. If a male relative dies of cancer, I'm for sure going to get it. And I was like, why would you even say that? And he's like, you know, then he started talking about genes and all this kind of stuff. And I said, oh my God, have you listened to nothing I said? And he's like, well, I know you start and then you finish and then you're done. So this slide is kind of, kind of very reminiscent of that. Survivorship, of course, really does look like all those other things. And the interesting part of the, the group that founded NCCS, um, which by the way, I have to also add, they in the very beginning, in fact, they held seven of them, they called them assemblies. So they called their first gathering, their first assembly. They held six more after that, that were, were survivorship um, meetings, three-day uh, events. That too was revolutionary in 1986. Right. Now, of course, there's survivor all right. over the country. Right. That's right. Um, then they realized that to really get the work done that they wanted to do, they needed to relocate from Albuquerque, the wonderfully obscure place that they came together. Um, they needed to move to D.C., um, and station themselves between NIH, where research is done, and Congress, where research is funded. So anyway, <clears throat> so the facts, I think, back to the story about my brother, I said to him, so the greatest risk factors um, for cancer are aging. Um, and as humans, we are living longer. So of course, there is more chance that we might be diagnosed. One in three women and one in two men living today, as most of you know, have either been diagnosed or will be. Um, as survivors, we now member, number 17 million just in the US. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, genetics and everything else aside, it's just rotten luck. Mm -hmm. And we still don't have a terribly good handle on, on why cells go wonky in the first place. It's, it's an ongoing study to be sure. And as I mentioned early on, when we're diagnosed, we spend so much time focused on that moment. Yes. And I remember I got, as I was checking out of the hospital, the American Cancer Society representative, not that it's not, not that I, I think the organization's wonderful, but she brought me this book about cancer. And it was like a 300 page book with one page, a few paragraphs at the back about survivorship should have been the exact opposite. Right. First page should have been, you've been diagnosed with cancer. Really sorry. It sucks. But um, there's, here's what's coming and what you can do and, and all those kinds of things. And I know for a fact that they've changed that. Um, so it doesn't end when treatment does. We know that. But if living is the whole point of that wretched treatment that we went through, that's where our focus needs to be. We need to, whether we've been told we have no evidence of disease or that we have to live with our cancer, we need to focus on life. And that's what my little organization has done. The women, the hundreds, maybe probably thousands of women that I've met in the course of all of this, oh my God, they're miraculous. And they in turn are so inspirational to one another. And it's sort of this, this giant, Love fest. Pay it for love that fest. slide. Excuse me, Judy. I'm sorry. Um, you're talking about your wonderful organization. I want to make sure that we shine the light on your wonderful organization. Can we advance the slide, please? And we're going to come back to this one in a minute. We're going to advance one more, please. And this is her wonderful organization that she's talking about. Can you, you. can you repeat what you just said about what the organization does yes. and how we are helping patients? Right. So our whole focus is to support and celebrate women survivors of all cancers who are giving back to the greater good. And we focus on women survivors uniquely because women and men heal differently. Um, and I, I would love it if, if some guys came together and created a male version of this, but women heal by collaborating and communicating and nurturing each other. So our annual fundraiser is a live storytelling event. This is our cast bow at the end of the 1919 oh. version. Um, Typically, nine or excuse me, eight women are selected um, to tell their stories each year by a, a very brave um, audition team. In this particular uh, performance, the two gals on the very left-hand side 
um, were, we called them the dynamic duo. They did a, a joint thing because they, they started an organization together for young women with fertility being their focus. But the money we raise allows us to hold quarterly girls night out events, which are nothing more than survivor networking. And if you go to asecondact.org, you can see photos of all of this. We um, also um, do workshops that help women consider what their skills, their passions, and their cancer might have uniquely qualified them to do in a second act. And not all second acts are need to be cancer related. I mean, animals, the environment, children, whatever your whatever makes your heart sing. That's what we want to um, want to embrace. It's very, I mean, it's incredible. I, I don't, literally don't know when you see. Can we also go back a slide now? And we're gonna, you're gonna tell us about the current book. Yes, we're making okay. sure everyone stays really sharp and alert. And I wanna thank uh, those of you that are writing some comments. A few of you have asked about slides. The slides will be available on our website and they'll also be on Facebook Live. Um, go ahead and tell us about your latest book. And then we're gonna go to a little book news that you have for us. That's right. Wonderful. So as a result of writing From Shadows to Life, I was introduced to Mary Lasker. She was a philanthropist. She was, by today's standards, a billionaire, had one of the largest private art collections in the country. But her focus was medical research. There was none in the United States prior to Mary Lasker coming on the scene. She's the reason the National Institutes of Health is plural. And the reason that anybody can go to their doctor and say, I have a lump right here. And the doctor can look at it and say, oh, that must be, it's because of the Institutes of Health who have done the research who can diagnose you and send you off for treatment. And that woman is the reason. And every day I'm getting chills just talking about her. I mean, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going back to the book. I have just started chapter 12 of probably 15 chapters and she's astounding. And look at this picture. I see Meryl Streep playing Mary Lasker in the movie version. <laughs> I, I'm excited to read it. Um, I have to finish the, all my notes on this one as well. And I mean, I'm just obsessed with her living room too. It's gorgeous. And she looks oh, so yeah. good. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I appreciate all the deep work she does as well, but I can't help but note how incredible that scene is as well. Okay, Judy, I'm going to turn it back to you. But before I do, um, there's some incredible quotes um, from her critics, uh, which is critics always sound negative. These are the book reviewers. Um, and I'm going to read some, one of my favorites in here. And I'll tell you uh, why it's my favorite for a couple of reasons. Um, this is someone, um, Dr. Zebrak from the University of Michigan, also a cancer survivor. This is the quote about the book. I love it. It's history, biography, science, intrigue, drama, all wrapped into one. After reading The Emperor of All Melodies, <clears throat> I was left thinking, but what about people who actually had cancer? That is the book. What Dr. Mukherjee's book was about was cancer and science. This book is about cancer and people. And for me, that is more interesting. And I think that's such a huge compliment. Um, we all actually, we COA had Dr. Mukherjee as one of our keynotes at a huge oncology conference, and he was phenomenal. phenomenal. And thanks to my colleague, Mary Krasinski, I had happened to sit next to him at the dinner table. And uh, I was really impressed with him. And likewise, I'm impressed with you. So what a great compliment you got. Now tell, for those of us who, for those of our participants who have stuck around, um, why don't you tell them about what little surprise you have in store for them? So I would love to give away three copies of this book. Also, please know um, that Rose isn't paying me anything. I do these for nothing. So I'm happy to talk to any organization, anytime, live or in Zoom. And I'm also happy to send uh, signed book plates that you can put on the inside of your book. Oh. So just go to my website and you can find that. So, um, so I would love to give away three copies. And since I love birthdays, um, that's how we're going to do it. <clears throat> so this is going to hopefully not be too terribly confusing. <laughs> so um, today is June 8th. You're going to answer by uh, putting a note in the chat. Is anybody's birthday today? See anything? Nope. Oh, wait a minute. No, I got to know. Uh, okay. <laughs> Lorraine, you just teased us, Lorraine. <laughs> All right. Absence <laughs> app. We're glad you're um, does anyone have a, a June birthday? Yes, we got a June birthday. Okay, how many? We got a Jeanette Gonzalez and we got a Jessica Gentile, looks like. 
Oh, okay. We have got a lot of Junes. <laughs> and I'm seeing all the names come through. This is fun. Kim Twani, okay, June 16th. And we'll be able to capture these in the chat after. These are great. Uh, and give me a second here. And I'm just double checking. I know Drew will be able to catch all of these. Uh, someone wrote they have four staff members with June. This is for the lucky participants today. So Jeanette Gonzalez, Jessica Gentile, Christine. Oh, I know Christine. That's great. Oh, and oh, hi, Christine. I know Christine from Echo and Kent. So um, should I give them my email and then I will forward that to you and they can send me their address? How would you like to do that? Sure. Or you can just connect me directly to them. I mean, okay. I don't know if you have their email addresses, but connect me to them and I'll send the books out and I'm happy to sign them as well. Not guaranteeing that'll make the book more valuable, <laughs> but at least you'll know it's yours. People are talking to you in the same breath as Dr. Mukherjee, so I think that's pretty impressive. And as you mentioned, we are friends. Uh, Judy reached out to me many years ago when she was putting together one of her shows, and I was quite honored to be on the stage with you, and I'm glad that we're still connected and, and that we're both still survivors. Thank you to everyone who's wrote comments, um, and we have one more slide to go before we say goodbye. Let me close out the chat one minute. So we keep on bringing you interesting people and interesting organizations. Um, some of you may or may not heard of an organization called NORD, which is the National Organization of Rare Diseases. And I'm really excited to have another incredible nurse, Vice President of Patient Services from this organization called NORD. And what I've learned just from uh, some exploration on their website is uh, rare, diseases, rare diseases aren't as rare as we think. And it's going to be very educational for us to have Jill Pollander. Please join us next month and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Judy Pearson. Excuse a typo that I just noticed on there for, but you are an incredible person who's also a person. So thank you so much and thank you everyone. Have a great day.